Hello and welcome back to the Chili Chump podcast. I am Sean, also known as Chili Chump, and I'm joined today by my wife, Mrs. Chili Chump. Good to have you on. A little bit different. Uh, yeah, I'm not used to being quite in the spotlight now, so. <laughs> Uh, it'll be fine. So I've just got back from London, so we actually haven't really spoken for about a day and a half, two days now, which is not normal because we normally in each other's yep. pockets. Cheers. Nice to have you home. Mm. So I hear that uh, Barney was a little, little distraught that I wasn't around. Yeah, he was looking for you all over the place. So I think he was expecting you back before we went to bed. So. Uh. Yeah, he, he, was, he has his routine. He is, he's a little bit like me, isn't he, with the little habits is. that he has? Yes, yeah, so I had to get his little bowl of pumpkin seeds last <laughs> night so that yeah, he could I, have a bit of a treat. <laughs> I've been enjoying snacking on pumpkin seeds lately, and uh, he gets uh, a pumpkin seed every now and then. I don't know that he likes them. I mean, I, I don't know what he can get from them. They're tiny little things, but he sits there waiting for it. He sees me with pumpkin seeds, and he's up on the couch, and he's ready for his pumpkin seeds. When I first gave him... I uh, remember when I first was eating pumpkin seeds and I gave him one, he wasn't really interested. But no. now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, gaze longingly into your eyes. He like, Do- keeps pawing at you like, where's my seeds? <laughs> so, yeah, so he got his own pumpkin seeds last night. He did. Yeah. And then this morning, going and looking around your side of the bed. Yeah. Yeah. He normally, he knows I'm a bit more of a soft touch than, than <laughs> Caroline. So. Yeah. Actually, he say so tried it at two o'clock this morning, getting on the bed. So oh yeah, I put him. What did he try jumping on? Yeah, because he did jump on the other night, didn't he? He didn't jump. He kind of came and pulled my arm. Oh, okay. So I told him back in your bed, settled him down, and then before I knew it, it was eight o'clock, which is his well. breakfast time. So I missed out on cuddles this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, normally he comes because we oh, we've tried trying this new thing of. Um, letting him not be in his crate. So we leave the crate door open and then he can sleep on the floor on his little bed that he has. Or in the crate if he wants to be. (laughs) And um, then after 5 a.m. we've always said as long as he's, you know, gone out and done his business, then he's allowed up on the bed. And uh, he knows when 5 o'clock is there. And he, he normally, when he's in the crate, he moans. But he's not he's not whining too much. No. When he's out the crate now. So no. that's that's a good thing. So we're I think not it's having working to out well. Have to go and do early morning. But yeah, he comes in, nudges my elbow on the side of the bed sometimes, um, yeah. like early in the morning. And I'm like, nope, go to bed. And he goes to bed. So yeah. Yeah. No, he's doing really I, well. Still, Ali had his little 10 minute run around last night when I took oh, yeah? him up. Yeah. So yeah. zoomies at bedtime, never a good thing. Well, that's the problem as well. We can't really exercise him too much at the moment because of the operation he's just had. And, um, yeah, so what, what, we've got another four days of that? Monday he should get the all clear. Oh, that'll be good because, yeah. yeah, he needs his exercise and he's, he's normally, I think he'll sleep a lot better again. Yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, so I mentioned this in the last podcast with Steve that I want to give a bit more structure. I mean, the way I see it, this podcast – People are going to either like it or they're not going to be bothered. And either way is fine with me. I enjoy doing it. And for the people that are interested, cool. I won't take offense if they don't like me. <laughs> I'm sure they'll <laughs> love you. <clears throat> but uh, I said with the, in the last podcast with Steve that we would try and have it a bit more structured. So it's not just rambling. I think the last one was a long one, just under two, two hours, hours or so, um, which obviously it just that's a long it's a long old time and uh yeah again some people will enjoy that but it is also uh rather it's rather a lot of um a lot of time just rambling about nearly nothing so yeah a bit more structure so today we're going to try that um we're still going to find our feet i think uh with what exactly those segments are but i think a big one here, the big challenge we have, and you've mentioned this to me so many times when we do our live stream, uh, which again, if people aren't aware, mm-hmm. live stream first Sunday of every month, uh, we get so many questions and I cannot get to all of them. I try to. Um, one of the challenges is I try and get through so many that I end up just talking really quickly and people don't really hear what I'm saying because uh, I'm trying to get through so many. Uh, but regardless, I cannot get through as many as I, I would like to. So there's always a bunch of questions left over. And with the system I built to capture the questions, thankfully, I still have them sitting in a CSV file. So 
We have a few questions that uh, we'll go through. Mrs. Trillichamp will ask them to me because she can say them a lot slower than I normally do. And uh, we'll go through those in a bit. That'll be quite interesting. It's, it's mainly chili related. Well, I think the majority these days are chili related. In the beginning, when we first used to do the live stream, there was a lot of very personal questions, which I don't yeah. mind too There's much. There's a couple. There's, There's a, a couple. couple, yeah. And I don't mind. I mean, I'll answer what I can and, and what I'm comfortable with. But uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all in good fun, and we also do have a, a voice uh, message from WhatsApp. So I'll leave a link down below, or at least the phone number for WhatsApp, so people can you know come in and send a voice note if they want, if they have a question, and uh, I'll play it on the podcast and answer the question. So, well, the other thing that we've been doing with some of the questions is trying to figure out which ones actually lend themselves to a more detailed response as well so we have been working on pulling together all of sean's knowledge and expertise into articles on the uh, website as mm, well so caroline has been uh, we shouldn't be talking to the camera steve keeps telling me off of this i'm talking <laughs> to you here uh, you have been amazing doing this and yeah I, I just i wish i could do everything and i try and do everything but i just there's only so much time in the day but the articles that you've been helping me with, uh, putting together the structure and, uh, you know, just polishing it up for me has been incredible. And hopefully people can see the quality of the content that we're putting out. I think there's still a lot of people that probably aren't aware of just the sheer amount of content. Yeah. And there's some good stuff in there. I mean, it just helps to fill the gaps as well. You know, when you're producing video content, you can't go into all of that detail. No, you know, it doesn't keep people's attention, does it? So Exactly. Barney has something to say. Yeah. what he's barking it's probably barking at his uh, reflection again probably um but yeah the articles are helpful because i can go in depth and you know for example i think have we released that one yet uh just then six steps to growing chilies you released that one this week and yeah. then we've got a couple of fermenting ones for you too. well i mean the growing one perfect let's go with that you're right i mean there are a few guys out there that are trying to sell uh, ebooks around you know easy guides to growing chilies and that, and that and that's all great and good but you know i think the fundamentals you know it should be free access there's just you mm. know it's it, a lot of it is common sense for people like myself who have been doing this for a few years and you know just be great to get people to level up quickly in their beginning uh stages of of growing chilies and there's plenty of scope to you know do some books later on which we are working on so we are you know going to put together an ebook uh, i have told you this right yes so <laughs> we are putting together an ebook uh maybe, maybe a, even an imprint book but i think ebook seems to be the way to go with these things which will go far more in depth rather than just the surface level you know when i say surface level you follow that article Thanks. of mine it's going to take you through an entire season and you're going to get good results but if you want to get more in depth you want to know a little bit more about the the nutrient side of things that sort of stuff is what we're going to cover off in there so that's coming in a little while uh we're working on it talking of ebooks thank you so much for helping me put together the, the ebook version of the stay spicy recipe book that is out there now if anybody wants to go and buy it it's on my website um we've had so many sales of it already so obviously the demand was there it was just i think people assume it's an easy job of just taking a file and then you know save as pdf and there you go it's not as simple as that so we have made a few amendments in that file so it is a little different from the actual hard copy of the recipe book if you do have it we've corrected a few mistakes that we made in the original book and uh, we've also put a lot of links because obviously yeah. ebook means you can go and click on those links and take you through to the YouTube uh, videos of mine or, you know, links to the things I'm using. So I think that's also quite helpful, but that is available now and there'll be some more coming as well in the future. Thanks to your help. Um, yeah. And there was one other thing I, I, I'm noticing over there and I'm, and I'm desperate to try it. <laughs> so what's that about? Yeah. So Obviously, people know that you like your chilies, but one thing they probably don't know is that you're also a massive fan of prawn cocktail crisps. So I <laughs> spotted these yesterday. I've taken them out of the packet just so that... Because not... make a lovely noise. Yeah. Uh, but, you know... Spicy prawn cocktail. That is... That's pretty cool. And uh, up close there, if you are watching this on video, um, this is from Walker's Max Strong Spicy Prawn Cocktail. Now, yeah, I do love the, the prawn cocktail. Caroline's not a big fan of it because it does smell quite a bit. It does. But uh, spicy prawn cocktail sounds like a I'm natural progression. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind trying. You um, haven't tried it yet? No, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, okay. I thought, you know, 
your viewers and listeners would want the whole ASMR oh, experience. Okay. So, there's there some people that, that do love that, and then there's some that really do not. Yeah, it freaks me out, so, so I might sorry. try one later. <laughs> the, if, if you really don't like hearing people eating, you might want to mute for a second. <laughs> At least crunching is a nice sound. It's not like the... <laughs> Believe me, it's still great on some people. That, that was awesome. That was yeah. really good. Yeah, it's got a bit of sweetness to it, and um, obviously the prawn cocktail providing that sweetness, and a good bit of spice. I'd say similar to the spice because uh, they also do they do the, the chicken wings. Max do the chicken wings, yeah. spicy chicken wings. It's that sort of spice, not too hot. Yeah. So yeah, but it, I mean, listen, it's not going to satisfy a proper heat craving. No. But that's that's really good. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to take them away so that you, mm. <laughs> you don't offend the listeners for the next <laughs> hour. <laughs> Yeah, so well, let's jump straight in. Um, so actually, there was one other section that we're going to have, and we'll get to that in a little while. Um, actually, maybe we'll, we'll start off with it, I think, because questions we can get to that so. a bit later. And uh, I've forgotten I'm actually quite hungry. I haven't really yeah. eaten. I <laughs> ate a sandwich on the train on the way back, but less than done after this. Uh, it means we can keep you to time more. <laughs> Force me to come back to time. So this other section here, there's... Uh, I thought, I mean, it makes sense, right? I'm a chili grower and all that, and I do keep on top of the news of what's mm -hmm. going on out there. I try to as much as I can, especially around the chili world, seeing what's happening. And I think a good segment here is just going on uh, around chilies in the news. Absolutely. So definitely, I think this is something that will be recurring because uh, there's stuff happening in the chili world all the time. And... Um, well, of course, you were in the news as well this week. Oh. I was indeed. <laughs> that was an interesting experience. Um, some of you probably have seen that article if you have searched Chili Chump lately. Uh, that was that was interesting. We had a reporter come around at one of the local publications. And, um, yeah, um, there's a video out on my channel as well, so you might have seen that too, where I got him to try a chocolate primatale. He did well. I was mm. impressed. So. I was I was surprised. I was I was worried. I was like, oh man, if this guy's wrong, that article's gonna be <laughs> terrible. <laughs> At least we didn't break him. So. Yeah, no, I think well though, thankfully it was just just the tip, literally just the tip. So <laughs> I think he managed that all right. Um but talking about eating chilies, so I saw this article actually I first saw it actually a little while ago. I knew that this was happening. Uh, Guinness World Record attempt on eating Carolina Reapers the number of Carolina Reapers in a set amount of time. But I actually got reminded of this, uh, one of my moderators, you know, Kelly. We, yeah, yeah. We've had Kelly around here a few times. Uh, but she posted this up on Discord. I don't know if you saw it. I didn't. Today. No, I didn't. Yeah, she posted know. up the article, and I'm like, I knew the basics of it. I kept seeing it popping up in the news, um, this chap eating these chilies. And I'm like, you're nuts. You're nuts. I know what it feels like to eat a super hot and – this guy is eating multiple super hearts, but when you read into this even further, you realize, wow. So, um, <laughs> Caroline Reaper, we all know what that is. Uh, we all know the heat level of that. But uh, a Canadian man broke the world record for eating 50 of these chilies in the fastest time. So, it says here, speed eater, Mike Jack. But, I mean, I mean, you have to be a speed eater. Imagine, imagine he doesn't actually like chilies. Yeah, he's I just, think he just eats the hot dogs skins, quickest, and he, so. you know. But now he's actually yeah. doing it with Reapers. That's that's taking a whole new level. So he did um, the, managed this feat. He managed fifty Carolina Reapers in six minutes and forty nine seconds. Now, I uh, I think I could eat a lot of chilies, like as as hot as you know what we did last Sunday. Uh, well, what was that? That was the Naga Viper, mm. which. Wow, that that had some heat. I didn't eat the whole thing, but no. man, that that knocked me for six. But that lasts for like ten minutes. It takes a little while for it to kick in. So I'd say probably the first minute, it's still building up and has not really got to that high level. So you could probably get a whole bunch more in mm. in that time. The problem here is and he's doing fifty in six minutes. So fifty of these things. But then he didn't stop there. He hit the record and he thought. Ah, I'll just carry on. And he ate another 85. So he set the bar high. <laughs> now, the problem I have with this is I know how this feels going down. So unless he somehow is able to bring mm -hmm. it up again, which unfortunately I cannot. I do not know 
I just physically cannot do it. I've tried it, but I cannot purge that sort of stuff. So unless he did that, I mean, even if he did that, he's still going to have some of it it's going down. Yeah. But those cramps are real, and it's it's no joke. When you're eating that amount, it must have hurt. It has to have hurt. Yeah, he did uh, 85 plus 50. So what's that, 125? 135. 135. Yeah, yeah I mean, I... I my tolerance is not that high, and I know you volunteered me for eating a super hot when you hit one million subscribers. Um, I'm hoping it takes a while to get there because I saw <laughs> how you've while. been, uh, or I've seen what your I, suffering I'm, has been like after eating some of those. I have a morbid curiosity. I, my protective side of you doesn't want you to do it, um, but I also would love you to experience it. It's, it's like the. The morbid curiosity, it's also just wanting you to kind of feel what I feel sometimes. <laughs> um, but I think you also enjoy the experience. As much as it'll hurt, I think the overall experience you'll enjoy. The endorphin rush. The endorphin rush is real. I mean, it, it was actually very evident. I, I don't know if I, I could feel it. I could feel my energy level change mm. uh, on the live stream, uh, feeling a little bit more euphoric and um, happier. It just mm. it just does that, right? I, I think it's. I mean, I don't want to belittle things like depression, but you know, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to see what it does for depression. I, if I'm having a down day, having a bit of spice it really picks me up. And I know depression isn't just having a down day, but still, I think there must be something to it. And the endorphins that are pushing out, it's it's a very real effect. But yeah, that's crazy, man. Um, so it says here yeah, that that uh, Mike has worked to build up a tolerance to spiciness over the past twenty years. So he is a yeah. he is a chilly head. Then um, that would be great. I actually need to probably reach out to this guy. It'd be great to have a mm-hmm. conversation with him. So ask him what the hell was he thinking and how he felt afterwards. So it says yeah, he actually there's a quote from him. Um, <laughs> so. Guinness World Records has also shared Jack's words about the experience. The first pepper is the worst. The initial shock of spiciness is intense. The second one doesn't seem as bad, but each one gets that bit hotter and hotter as the peppers touch new places in your mouth. But it's also the builder. I mean, a lot of these super hots are builders. So what he's feeling is just building up and the more and more you're putting in there, it's just extending that Mm. pain. Uh, but the extreme extreme discomfort brought on by the chilies doesn't just affect the mouth. It also wreaks havoc with the stomach. And he says, I get bad cramps. It feels like someone is squeezing and twisting my guts. Yep, that's pretty much it. Your mind is telling you to stop, but you have to convince yourself to keep pushing through. That's crazy. And there's some great pictures here. I'll I'll leave a link down uh, below for this article uh, in the description of the podcast. I think I'm able to do that. But uh, yeah, have a look at that. That's pretty extreme. Can you not take on a challenge like that? I wouldn't. I've been to many chili festivals and, yeah. you know, I, I just, no, I've got nothing to prove. And, you know, good on these guys for doing it. I have one of my uh, patrons um, on Discord who's actually been in one of these. Yeah. And, yeah, he won't do it again. There's no <laughs> way. But yeah, he had a good experience and he enjoyed it. I think he actually won it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. On that topic, mm-hmm. one question that you did have was from Pepper Guy, who said, how long have you been growing peppers for? That's not on the topic. How's that on the topic? Well, it, it's going to lead me on to another oh, okay. question. So I think just giving people an idea as to how long you've been growing and eating peppers. So, eat, But eating peppers, that's a different story. I, I've got so many stories of um, just getting excited about spiciness. I think every guy has experienced this at some point where you're like challenging your mates, your brother. In my case, it was my brother and yeah. my uncle in Zimbabwe. Um, they'd come back from the Congo uh, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, they had gone out to do some work there and they came back with this jar. I mean, they, they told me some story. And I don't know what I believe because I know they always used to take them Mickey and they would always BS me. But they had this little jar and, and they said it was from a, you know, an old woman that they found uh, in a village somewhere and she made this stuff and with Congolese chili, which the Congolese chili is a real thing. Um, I think it's just an, like a Naga Viper, that sort of thing. Okay. It's super hot. <clears throat> and um, she had made this chili sauce and this is what she makes and they, they bought a bottle of a jar of it. And uh, I mean, the way they were talking about it is like it, when you open the top, it starts smoking. <laughs> it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but then they, they dared me to try some and, 
they just dipped the spoon in it and I had some of that and wow, that was, that was a killer. But I mean, it took me like 30 minutes before I decided I was going to go ahead with it because they kept on, you know, riling me up about it. But it's that sort of stuff. I mean, all our life we've had that, but we've never gone to the extremes really of where we are today with the stuff we're eating. Uh, when we were younger, it was more like, you know, eat some peri peris, like mm. African bird's eye. Those are hot. They still are hot today. There's no joke about it. I mean, they're 100, 175,000 Scoville. That's still a hot chili. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the amount of heat that I'm putting out and using and eating now is very different, taken to a different level. But growing chilies. Uh, well, it was a super hot that got you into growing chilies. Yeah, the, well, the butcher loki. And there's, I think there's another question there about uh, what's my favorite tasting uh, yes. super hot. So what is the there. hottest pepper you enjoy Eating. Eating. And That's that a great was question. From, from um, Nick Ullman. And I, and I think part of it's nostalgia. Yeah. And part of it is because of, it's a fantastic tasting chili. So that's what got me started properly growing chilies, like on purpose. In South Africa, we used to grow chilies, but it would be like, oh, we have a, we happen to have a peri peri bush growing, <laughs> growing in the garden. <laughs> and we're picking up peri peris and we're using that in our you know meals and sauces. So th that was that. But I mean, it was growing wild, essentially. When I came over to the UK, uh, I was living down in Brighton at the time. I think it was around 2005, 2006. The Guinness World Records had just announced that the butcher loki or the ghost pepper was now the world's hottest chili. I think it was 2006. And it struck a chord with me. And I was like, I've got to grow these. <laughs> you know, I've got to see it. And everyone was talking about the butcher loki as some... Um, some kind of like fabled thing that's really impossible to grow uh, unless you live in the Himalayas and all this other stuff. And I was like, hey, I'm up for a challenge. And that's what, yeah, that's what really got me into it. And it, it, because of the way I had to grow it, that's what got me really excited about it because I, I had to figure out a system to try and replicate the environment it came from, mm. which is the same. It's the same approach I take today with growing. It's, you know, everything I do, it's, trying to think, well, how would this be in nature? How would this grow in nature? What sort of requirements would it need out there? And that's what I try and relate to. But yeah, I had to build a, a shed that I lined out with um, some insulation and um, reflective white panels. And I was using, a, I think it was a 600 watt HID, so high intensity discharge. We consider all the lights that I have inside my grow shed now and I have loads. I had just one of these in there, mm. and that probably was more powerful than all these lights put together. And I put out a ton of heat, so I had extractor fans in that, which kind of caused a problem when the cops came around and <laughs> were, were asking questions because they had some uh, overhead aerial views of our property during the winter, and we were shining bright red on <laughs> the shed, and they thought I was growing something a bit dodgy, which... It was weird. I was not growing anything dodgy. It was chilies. So that was turned into a bit of an interesting situation. But most of the information that I got at that time was from growers that were growing the illegal stuff. Um, all the best information on lighting, on things like that, I got from there. So there was a lot of misinformation in terms of what I'm doing with chilies. Like, uh, you know, chilies don't need a day-night cycle. They don't need darkness to continue, whereas growing marijuana, you do need a night cycle. You have mm. to, it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And, and I had to learn that for myself and figure out all that sort of stuff. But, it, yeah, that's what got me into it. So 2006, that's since then. And, uh, yeah, just been learning every year since and uh, still learning to this day. I'm not, I'm, Yes, you could consider me an expert in this because of how long I've been doing it and I get the results I do. But in my mind, I'm still learning. I'm still, the, you know, there's still so much to learn. And I think I think everybody, that's something to take away. Everybody needs to, they need to be like that. No matter how good you are or what you do, oh. you need to keep your mind open. You need to be open to learning something new. The day you say that I don't have anything else to learn, you, you're starting to fail because... That's that's all you're ever going to learn. You're never going to learn anything more. Well, that's why you enjoy your experiments so much as well, isn't it? Yeah, I need to be doing more of those, yes. finding the time. <laughs> so is the butchalokia the hottest pepper that you enjoy? So, yeah, it's still, the it, like I said, from the nostalgia perspective and also the taste. It's a beautiful tasting chilli. Um, you know, I love these super hots like the Chocolate Primatale, the Seven Pot Prima. I absolutely love those. Seven Pot Prima is a good one. If you're going to go for a super hot, uh, 
and you want to make super hot sauce because the, the butch loki is hot but it's around the million scoville so it's one of the first that were kind of officially tested um i'm hearing i'm hearing uh, the bells ringing at the back door and that means our dog needs to go uh, outside so we're gonna pause yeah, we, uh, for just a second <laughs> Cleverly came up with a system. I think it was your idea, actually. Uh, we're hanging bells from the back door, or any door, actually. And he, um, when he wants to go out, he pours it, or he does he is he hitting it with his nose, or is he actually pouring hitting it? it with his nose? Yeah, he does that. Too. We have one in the bedroom. Did you buy a second one? I've bought the second one. It's not arrived yet. Oh, okay, but yeah, you use it. And I'm amazed. I'd never thought. I never thought it would work. Hey, honestly. I read it somewhere, so I can't take credit. But it works, yeah. Every time, so the way we trained him was just to every time we take him out, just jingle the bells, then he associates that with going out. And now, if he wants to go out, he jingles the bells, goes out, does his business, comes back in, works out fantastically. Yeah. Hopefully, in the future, we'll have a little doggy door and he can let himself in and out. But yeah, that'll be nice. Yeah. So um, let's go. I've got another article here. Uh, this one. This is an interesting one. So I, I did a video, and you, you know how much work I put into that video of the health. Yeah. The health benefits of chilies. I did a ton of research, and there's some amazing research out there uh, in proper, you know, scientific publications that are backing up everything that I said in there. And one of the things I said there was about stomach ulcers, because it's quite interesting. A lot of people associate chilies or spicy things with stomach ulcers or creating stomach ulcers, but it they don't. <laughs> is it a ghost? Is Bonnie uh, messing yeah. about on there? Sorry, um, but. You know, stomach ulcers, if you already have a stomach ulcer and you're eating chilies, then yeah, it's going to hurt, right? But chilies do not cause stomach ulcers. And there have been some uh, scientific papers and some studies, medical studies, that have been done around not curing ulcers, but repairing them and helping to repair them. So there is some stuff out there. Uh, I think it's still early days with some of that research. But then you get people that are doing this from a highly commercial perspective. They've something to sell and they misconstrue some of this stuff. And, and that sort of thing, it really bugs me because it sets things back. It sets this sort of work back. Now, this article title is No Evidence Cayenne Pepper Will Heal a Stomach Ulcer. Now, that's a sensationalist title, right? And great whatever but this this comes from a video that was put up on instagram so it was liked more than fifty thousand times on instagram and that's a video I'll, again i'll link all the articles i'm talking about today i'll link it down in the description of this podcast but uh, in this uh, the video features a natrio a naturopath um tough words to say mm. called barbara o'neill who we have fact checked before falsely claiming that cayenne pepper will heal a stomach ulcer among other things now, when you start reading into this, I, I went down a little bit further in the article, and this bugs me quite a bit, because again, I did another video around the time that I did the health benefits article, I uh, did, you know, facts about chilies. Mm. And one of the first facts that I mentioned there was just that chilies can be called so many different things. And, you know, the bell pepper, it's not pepper, it's called pepper because of certain issue and I don't want to get into that right now people can go to the video and complain about it there but certain uh, explorers way back when uh, decided to call chilies peppers because at the time pepper or peppercorns were one of the most expensive things in the world so it's part of the, the spice route and that was all around this sort of stuff so growing peppercorns was a very difficult thing growing chilies however was a lot cheaper so this particular explorer uh, and, and it wasn't just him. I mean, there was a few other things that were going on at the time. But people started associating and they started calling these little chilies that this person was bringing home, they're calling it pepper because it had a similar sort of spicy or piquant sort of um, flavor, flavor mm. sensation. And that gradually just got to a point where everybody just, you know, certain call certain things peppers. Now, a bell pepper and a jalapeno are actually far closer related than people think. Now, jalapeno, people would call that a chili or jalapeno, jalapeno, however you want to say it. Uh, they would say that that is a chili, but a bell pepper, it's a pepper. It's not a chili. Well, actually, it is because they're all from the same genus, which is mm. cap capsicum. Um, so, actually, those two, I mentioned those two because uh, jalapeno is a capsicum anum and so is a bell pepper. 
Capsicapanuma. So they come from exactly the same species as well, not just the same genus. But this lady goes and says, um, <laughs> Mrs. O'Neill says, cayenne pepper is a remarkable herb while holding up a jar of spice of the spice. She goes on to say, cayenne pepper is not a chili. Chili comes from the chili family and cayenne pepper comes from the capsicum family. I mean, seriously, you know, I, just, I read that part. That's what made me want to read out this article. Because, I mean, people just confidently claim these things. And and in my other life that I have, uh, beyond the chili side of things, I, it, I see the same thing happening. Um, I, I won't go into too much detail <laughs> about it, but it was today when I was at a, at a conference and there was a certain individual that, confidently was saying a lot of things around generative AI. And I was like, mm, yeah, that's not right. Uh, that's not correct at all. But anyway, people, I don't know, it's it's blind confidence sometimes. And when, when I see this- it comes to something like health. It, this is the problem. It's more important. And this is the problem. It sets yeah. things back because there is legitimate research going on around this stuff. Um, the TRPV1 receptor, which is, what uh, in your body, that's what is the receptor for uh, caps, capsaicin, the actual spicy part of a chili. That's, it's a relatively new discovery. Mm. Um, and they, they won a Nobel Prize for it. Again, I talk about this in my health video. And this is like, when I say recent, I'm talking like late 90s. I think it was the late 90s when this was discovered. And, and that change things because off the back of that there's been a lot more research done when they know what the what the active um you know, sensor is they're able to do far more targeted research mm. including things like this for ulcers but there's also alzheimer research uh cancer research which is fascinating to me and and, and that was a tough one because you know yeah. i had to be very careful with how i said certain things but the fact is there's legitimate research going on around this and yeah, people like this, quacks like this, uh, and yes, Mrs. O'Neill, you are a quack. It just it just sets things back so much, and you know people will then quote this. Mm. They'll quote the headline saying, "Oh, there's no evidence that cayenne pepper will heal the stomach ulcer." Great, yeah, but that that's not a blanket. That that is a very blanket statement for this. You know that it doesn't go into details of what it can actually do. Anyway, I, I just thought I'd mention this article again. I'll link to it down below. Um, it, it gives me an opportunity for, you know, to try and push people to go and watch my video again. You know, forget the fact that, you know, I want you guys watching my content. The fact is it's an interesting video and I'm quoting, I, I link to all the different research uh, publications that are out there that I use to back up what I was saying in that video. And it's fascinating stuff. I'll, I'll do a follow up again. I think it's too soon now, but maybe in a couple of years' time, and to see where that research is mm. and what changes there've been in between the period of time. So I will do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a, a nice side effect, isn't it, of uh, being able to enjoy chilies, just knowing that there are health benefits that go alongside them. Yeah. Coincidentally, oh, <laughs> just it? after we were talking about this earlier, I had a TikTok uh, pop up that suggests that cherries are good for inflammation. So, you know, Kelly, who has now got a second mention of the podcast, <laughs> will be very pleased to know that your peri-peri cherry. Oh, there you go. Your peri cherries, you've got <laughs> cherries. Even gonna... more <laughs> health Perfect. benefits. Oh, and I love cherries as well. Me too. Fresh cherries. Mm. <laughs> That's a little treat that uh, Mrs. Chili Chum buys me whenever they're out fresh in the market. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's an added benefit. I don't eat chilies because it has the health benefits. I... I eat chilies. Well, actually, it is a health benefit. It makes me feel good. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that is a health benefit in itself. And you enjoy the flavors. I love the flavors. I love what it does to a meal. It changes a meal from being an okay meal to something that's, like, exciting. And it is. So there was one last article I was going to mention, and then you can give me all your questions. Okay. So... <laughs> So we put out an article that so you'll be aware of this because we put an article out on uh, our on our channel on our chilichump.com website and it was talking about making your own sriracha because there's a shortage. And an article, I was just doing some research to see where we are with this shortage because I've been seeing a few things pop up on my Instagram and uh, a few other places where it's showing ridiculous prices for a bottle of sriracha. I mean I saw 50 quid. 
What? In one. Yeah, 50 quid for a normal bottle of Sriracha. It's nothing. And that was on, and that was, that was, sorry, that was 40, 42 quid. 50 quid I saw on eBay, but I saw this in a supermarket. They were showing it at 42 quid. Wow. Which is insane. But yeah, I'll go into the, the, the whole article and what it actually is talking about. But uh, where's that bit here? Uh, where are we? So yeah, um, so strained suppliers relations coupled with adverse agricultural conditions have left Hoifeng Foods Sriracha out of stock at, mo at many grocers nationwide. Bottles of the hot sauce were going for as much as $52 on third party sellers such as Amazon as of Thursday. Oh. Uh, so this is a recent article. This is well, recent-ish. Um, end of August. And, uh, you know, it looks like it is settling out a little bit, but it, it looks like fundamentally the reason for the shortage, because this is this, I remember this happening last year as well. And I, and I thought at the time, is this just a sales gimmick? Is it a marketing ploy, you know, trying to create some scarcity so people rush out to go and buy it and stock up? And it did, it happened. People were stocking up on it. Um, but it seems like there, there's more to it. So I think, and I don't know if the article goes into it, but a little while back, the Sriracha brand, they, uh, there's the Hoi Fong, so there's lots of different Srirachas. Um, the Hoi Fong brand, they never, never copyrighted Sriracha, uh, cause I think it's, it's the name of a town. And, um, they used to use Serranos, so Serrano chilies, mm. but they changed it over to jalapenos because well, happy is they're going to have uh, a bigger amount of flesh on each chili, so it's easier to harvest. And they had they they went into an agreement with a farmer, uh, I think Underwood Ranches, that's what it's called in Ventura County in California. They supply Hui Fong's peppers, well, says for twenty eight years. So I don't know. Yeah. They, they, there's a lot more to the story, but basically they changed suppliers. They changed it from Serrano to Jalapeno, and then. I think there's a bit of there's a bit of stuff going on 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 the legal side, and basically, I think Hoi Fong had overextended themselves. I mean, it depends who you ask, but they had paid up for the following year's harvest before the harvest came in, so basically buying futures, mm. and then so they overpaid Underwood Ranches for its crops from the 2016 season, and then they've been trying to do a catch up since then. Um, there was a, uh, so they had a contract with this, the farmers to, uh, get these chilies from them, but a certain amount each year. So even though they overpaid, they still had a contract to pay in that year, a certain amount. And actually the guy, Craig Underwood from that company won 23 million in judgment. Wow. So, yeah. Um, but then he had to also pay back 1.5 million that Hoi Fong had overpaid. And uh, it, it's just, it's a bit messy. Um, so now Hoi Fong Foods are sourcing its peppers from farms in California, New Mexico, and Mexico. And I think, yeah, I think they've changed over to the jalapeno from then. So it might have been that the Serrano was when they were still getting them from Underwood mm -hmm. Ranches, but now they're getting jalapeno from others and they can't, they can't keep on top of the suppliers. Suppliers aren't being as consistent. So it's kind of bite in hand that feeds you in a way. I'm sure there's a lot more to the story. Oh, especially sure. after 20 odd years of but working with a farm. Yeah, you'd know. think they would have been able to come to an agreement. It would have been nice for everyone. Um, but um, like I say, I'm sure there's a lot more to the story than what we see. But at the same time, it's quite interesting because this year my harvest has been hit and miss some some things i've done really well with and with some others not so much uh, last year was the bumper year we had so many crops uh, so much of a harvest because uh, the weather was good and and i'm sure we have some of the issues when you are growing in california even though the weather is probably a lot nicer than what we have here the fact is there are going to be still some discrepancies each year you know you're not going to get exactly you can't guarantee a harvest every year there's always little problems that could come up less rain or you know maybe insect damage or just the health of the plants i mean there could be so many different things that affect it but anyway i'm sure that uh, they'll sort things out there's plenty of growers out there um that would be more than happy to be providing chilies to hoi fong so i'm sure you'll find some solution to this you've not had a corn yet no? <laughs> <laughs> i do get asked now and then for people wanting to buy some of my chilies but they don't uh, want the CC jalapenos for their sriracha, no? <laughs> Those are hot. 
that, I've had some great feedback. I had some uh, messages actually on the way home on the train today from some people thanking me for the awesome seeds that they got from me. Yeah. In particular, the CC jalapeno, the sense the spiciest and biggest yeah. jalapenos I've ever had, and they're loving it. Because that's, that's a question I get sometimes before I put this on the market was, um, I, I'm so disappointed each year with my jalapenos. Mm. They're either very small, they don't have a lot of spice, they don't give me a big harvest. And it's like, well, that's exactly why I've been isolating and, you know, getting my CC Jalapeno to get to this point. I've got a beautiful big pod. Yeah. That is damn hot. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a bit too hot sometimes, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful chili. Anyway, so those are the three articles. I will link them down below. Uh, some interesting stuff in the news. And yeah, I'll do that again next time. I'm sure that people are going to be interested if they're not keeping up with these sort of things. So, do you have any questions or am I, am I... Do you want to do your voice one first? Yeah, or? let me do the voice yeah. one. I haven't actually listened to it yet. <laughs> Be a surprise so it, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not very good. Um, it's not very good production when I play it blind, but uh, I know who sent it. So, hopefully, it's going to be something. I think something. you can trust them. Yeah. I hope so. Let's hope so. So, this is from Adrian. He's actually sent in a voicemail before. And please, guys... Feel free to send them in. Don't be shy, please. I really enjoy being able to respond to you guys like this. I mean, um, how do people send questions in? Well, to, but you do it in WhatsApp. You can send me an email with a voice note. But uh, WhatsApp seems to be the easiest, especially here in Europe. That's what we mainly use for communications. In in America, it's not really the main form. They use iMessage and things yeah. like that. What's up, Sean? As you're probably aware, I'm preparing to launch my own YouTube channel and all the social media accounts that go with it. And what I actually wanted to really ask you is how you would have approached your first video, given what you know now. It seems so daunting just to kind of get out that first video and being comfortable within the camera. So lastly, my other part of my question would be how you developed your comfort in front of the camera and if you have any other tips for aspiring YouTubers. So the question from Adrian there, um, what, what should you, you know, putting out your first video, I I think, so I know Adrian quite well, and I know his approach to this is a little different to how my approach was originally. I wasn't, I never expected I was ever going to be in this position where I have thousands of people watching my content and listening to me on a podcast with my wife. Um, I never expected to be in this position. So when I put up my first video, don't get me wrong, I was nervous as all hell because, you know, I, number one, I don't like the sound of my own voice. I really do not. Um, and when you're having to edit videos, believe me, you have to hear your voice a lot. And um, and also just the, the video quality, you're putting yourself out there, right? And I made that first video, I edited it, it didn't take me very long, and I put it out there, and that was it. And I, I suggest the same. If you are starting a YouTube channel, even if your intention is to be the next Mr. Beast, you have to start with that first video. And consider your first 100 videos throwaway videos. You know, uh, Caroline is going through a lot of my old content right next to me while I'm <laughs> sitting at the computer. And she's going through some of my old content to help with some of the articles that I'm doing. So she's getting little tidbits of information that helps out in the articles. And I'm having to hear myself in those and man, I cringe, but those early videos, you go back, look at videos uh, like my garden update videos from 2018. Believe me, when I put those videos out, I thought they were brilliant. I thought this is great. Editing is great. I sound fantastic. It's all good. And I listen to it now and I'm like, wow, what is I thinking? Why are you guys watching this? <laughs> and, and it's tough, yeah, because there's a lot to learn, and, that, and that's the reason why Mr. Beast even says this, right? I've mentioned him twice now in this video, and it's not for any any other reason than he has some good advice and he is the biggest YouTuber out there. But he said just the first hundred, or I think he even said more than a hundred, but in my mind, the first hundred videos are throwaways. They are gimmies, right? They're not, you shouldn't consider them being uh, masterpieces. You, for all I know, you might be putting out masterpieces, but... The likelihood is you're not. The things I've learned during my journey have been things I never even, I couldn't have planned for. Um, well, it's incremental as well, isn't it? That was something that you were talking it. to the reporter about. There's, there's a word for it. I wish I could remember. Um, 
Krausen? Kazen. Is it Kazen? Kazen. Kazen. There yeah, you go. I love that word. <laughs> Kazen. Make small changes, improvements on every little thing you do. And, that, and that's my mantra. When I went in making videos, even from the early days, um, again, not, not the first video and not even the second or third because I put out some time-lapse stuff. <laughs> uh, but when I started actually making videos that I was hoping people were going to watch, Every time I put a video out, I wanted to improve one thing. And it could be little things. It could be the way my titles are. It could be my autofocus. It could have been my lighting. Uh, it could be something to do with my audio. Something small in every video. As long as you do that, believe me, it all adds up and you end up with decent quality and it, it makes it a lot easier to make content. So do those first 100 videos. That's all I can suggest. That very first video, listen. The likelihood is not many people are going to watch it. And you're doing something that, you know, you're in the 1% of the population because there's not a lot of people that are willing to put themselves out there. And one thing I've realized, one thing I know from my other job that I have, I do a lot of public speaking. And the one thing I've learned is people aren't paying as much attention to you as you think. So... Even when they're watching a video of yours, the little mistakes that you might notice, uh, you know, your hair out of place or this and that. Yes, believe me, there are going to be some commenters that are always going to notice these things. But 99% of them, they're listening to the content and they want you to succeed. They want the video to be good. People don't want to cringe. People don't want to be uncomfortable. So if you come across uncomfortable because you're so self-conscious, that comes across. So... Be confident, go out there, just have fun with it, put out that video and carry on from there. And yeah, I mean, the other question, I think he followed on there with um, what would I what would I do with, um, what, what did he say? I'll, I'll try and get back. In front of that. the camera, to within the camera, set out that first video and being comfortable within the camera. So lastly, my other part of my question would be how you developed your comfort in front of the camera. And if you- So again, th th that's the same exact thing what I was just Practice. talking about. That, that hundred, those first hundred videos, you're gonna get more and more comfortable in front of the, in front of the camera. Uh, well, you used to have a technique, didn't you, with doing your filming to- So th I did this, this was one of those times where I was trying to improve again, how I came across on camera. And it kind of, it, changed my whole perspective, it changed the whole way that I film and the whole way that I am on camera. And, and hopefully it comes across where I would film three different versions of my intro. One would be uh, my normal, this is me, hey, this is Sean, and I'm talking as I would talk to my wife or to anyone else, which in my head sounds fantastic. Uh, then I would do one that is over the top, like stupidly over the top just hey everyone how's it going you know really just give it a lot of energy and never how i would i would never talk in real life like that or at least i don't think i am but you do when you're passionate about something you do do that and that's what kind of came across and then the middle one was just like going in between those two where i was like give it a bit more energy in that and every time i did that the one that i was over the top way over the top that was the best take when you watch it back and you're putting it in the edit and as stupid as you feel doing that it comes across fine on camera you know where, where the camera adds uh 10 or 20 pounds so i think it adds a bit more to me either. my camera is terrible but i think it also drains you of a lot of the energy yeah. that you have and uh, that's something i had to learn the uh, I, I can 100% tell the difference between those videos back in 2018 and the videos I do now. And I, I do honestly worry sometimes, like, if, do people actually want to hear me sounding like I'm depressed or a monotone I, I, or I uncomfortable? Think you are <laughs> your biggest critic, and I think that goes for every creator anyway. So you're always going to be critical of the stuff that's gone before and think, Oh, I'd have done this differently. Well, I'll never say that. I'll, I'll never, I'll never redo old videos. I'll, I'll do new content. Maybe yeah. it'll be similar to what Updated. I've done before. But that those videos, I'll leave up there, right? If if I end up having a million subscribers or ten million subscribers, I'm not going to get rid of those videos. No. So what? They're there. That's fine. Absolutely. You know? You're putting children to sleep all over the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So yeah, I, I would say that that getting comfortable in front of the camera, just keep doing it. Um, 
I today I don't mind the sound of my voice as much. I'm more used to it. Um, I mean, you you know you you have the headphones, oh, so you can hear it. yourself talking. I can hear myself talking. It doesn't bother me as much, and and I think that's partly if, if people have ever recorded themselves and they listen to themselves back and say that's not what I sound like, but. If you do this often enough, you realize that is exactly what you sound like. Yeah. You, what you hear in your head is very different because your head resonates the the sounds a lot different than what people actually hearing coming out your mouth. So practice, practice, practice. Like with anything in life, just practice, 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 and don't hesitate. I keep telling, I keep asking Adrian, when are you putting out your video? Just put one out. It doesn't matter what it is. Get one out. You know, you're gonna hate it doesn't matter just get it out because the second one you'll hate a bit less and eventually <laughs> get to a point where you'll actually start enjoying it so thanks for that message and please guys send me a message uh send me voice notes and uh happy to play it on you and answer some questions as long as it's not too rude <laughs> so what questions we got there okay so emma cronin stopped at the services on sunday she was listening yeah. yeah um and she asks what's your all-time most popular video well, it's easy to check, Emma. Uh, <laughs> you can go and sort by most popular of my videos. But I think uh, you've had one or two that have kind of really taken off. There's a few that's, that's really blown up. Um, those two videos I talked about earlier, the health facts, the health benefits of chilies, mm. that, that did very well. Um, the the 10 facts about chilies as well, that did pretty well. But the biggest videos have been the food-related ones. And I think that's just general. Not everyone gr – is wanting to grow chilies. Not everyone does grow chilies, but everybody eats, right? Yeah. So I uh, did a couple of videos that have done very well in their hot sauce videos. The one was my Blazing Buffalo, I think it is. That's the first video of mine to go over a million views, which was amazing. And then uh, the next highest, I think, is my weapons grade uh, video. So everybody that's a combination of- the hot stuff. <laughs> the food side of it, but also watching a grown man cry. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, it, it's a, you know how I feel about this. You know, I, I love making those videos, but I think I also, I, this is going to sound so cliche. I want to make a difference. And if I can get one more person growing and it doesn't have to be growing chili, grow, grow something, just grow anything. Right. If I can get a young person that, you know, is feeling a bit lost in life and doesn't have direction, grow a plant, you know, and do it from seed and get right to the end. That's why I like chilies because you actually have something at the end. It's not just growing something pretty and there you go, you have some beautiful flowers, which you do, but be able to get a chili off the end and be able to use it in your food. It's like, I grew this and I'm going to chop this up now and stick it in this curry that I made. And that's fulfilling. And Even if you sneak in secretly <laughs> when your wife's not looking. Yeah, yeah but I think, I think that is... You know that that's why I like doing the growing videos. Uh, and I, I got a I got a message today again um, because you I think you're on my um, you're on one of my oh, social I saw. profiles. Yeah. And the guy was thanking me. He's yeah. like, I just want to thank you so much for your videos and that because you know it's the first year I've grown chilies and I actually got a decent harvest. I made some mistakes and I had some failures, but I actually got a harvest. And thank you so much. And it's like. That's awesome. That's the rewarding bit. Isn't That's it? hugely rewarding, yeah. right? Um, just hearing that somebody got some fulfillment out of it. I know how, if I've had a long day, me going out there and checking out my chilies, literally just you checking them out. haven't even been and checked on your babies today. I haven't had a chance. <laughs> got home and started doing this. But no, I mean, that's the first thing I'll do tomorrow morning. I'm itching yeah. to go check them out, yeah. right? Um, and well, I will We're harvesting as well at the moment, aren't we? Oh, no. It's an exciting <laughs> time. But you and your mom. <laughs> your yeah. poor mom. Oh. Mum felt so farewell bad. yesterday. <laughs> oh, no, I felt so bad when you told me. I, I mean, I bought gloves. They're actually sitting over there. I've got some uh, nitrile gloves for her. She's busy helping me put the seeds, um, you know, harvest the seeds for me and drying them out. And I'm doing some testing on them. But I, I told her, just be so careful, especially when you're starting to harvest the chocolate primatales, which she was doing yesterday. Yeah. And, yeah, she made a bit of an oopsie and touched her eye with Somehow she had it on her hands. Well, she touched, there was some transfer. Using gloves, which I yeah. told her off for afterwards. But. The, the gloves are cheap, so just use a new pair every time. That's perfectly fine. You don't have to reuse them. Um, but yeah, she touched her eye, and I uh, ah, felt so bad. But yeah, she came back. She was still doing seeds today, so <laughs> I think that? she's okay. Looking like Popeye. <laughs> no, no, she's all good. She's all good. 
Okay, so uh, one of the other questions we had from Londog was, you're growing your plants mostly in pots. What is the size in gallons that you think would be the minimum to make it through the lifespan, lifespan of a typical pepper plant? And I know you've done a bit of experimenting with I've done a lot of experimenting. I've done a video size. actually as well on yeah. pot size, and I think we have an article on the, on the website as well with uh, the reasons we pot up, and I do mention in there what my final pot size is. But in general, for me, it's a balance. <laughs> the, the main thing is about having the pot size, the final pot size that is going to allow the plant to produce a harvest by the end of the year. If you go with a pot that's too big and with the certain types of plants and you haven't planted in time and we get into like now where the weather is starting to dip down and that plant hasn't yet filled that pot out, you're unlikely to get a harvest, right? It's a big mistake that a lot of people make. They think big pot, big harvest. That's kind of true, but when you're in the UK or anywhere with a, a climate that's similar to ours, then that can be uh, very much challenge. And I think that's something people don't appreciate. They, uh, I get so much critique on my videos and I'm happy for it. But I think people don't quite realize where I'm growing. I'm not in South Africa. Mm. I don't have warm weather and frosts that uh, last for a month. We have frosts that last, well, from, well, now we were due our first frosts in October. And our, you know, our last frosts are going to be end of April, right? So that's a long time of the year that you can't grow. So you've got to optimize your grow between that. And for that, I generally go with. 10 litre pots that's my middle of the pack so i'll go with the 10 litre pot i can't do it in gallons because again i, I know you're in america and i think american gallons are a bit different so u.s gallons are different to um imperial gallons um uh, but if you do a conversion just do it on google convert uh, 10 liters to u.s gallon uh so 10 liters is the middle of the road if you're going to buy a bunch of pots just buy a bunch of 10 litre pots but i do have 7.5 litre pots and i have uh 12 litre pots and next year actually i actually haven't even talked about this i was going to talk about it on the live stream but next year i have some plans to use three litre pots as finals because i want to get earlier harvest with some chilies for the seed store yeah so i'll be using some smaller pots and that'll get much earlier harvest and i'll make more use of the space in little chump so yeah that's kind of the plan there. Um, one of the many boxes that have arrived recently is my three litre box. Yeah, I can't get through the front door at the moment with all the <laughs> boxes. Yeah, yeah that's mostly for the sauces. That's, um, my vinegar has finally arrived from Spain. Uh, Italy, actually, sorry. Yeah, because we, we were chatting earlier in the week because, again, some of these kind of big plants, it's quite interesting looking at them because, again, you can grow huge plants but actually if you're not getting the yields then what's the point yeah and, and, that, and that's the thing it, it is about the timing you've got to you've got to get your timing right you've got to get you know know your climate there's one of the challenges we had coming here is this is a very different climate to bedfordshire which is where we were mm. before now we're in lincolnshire we're further north uh, our frost states are bigger so we have a bigger part of the year where we have frost and it's the difference of maybe four weeks, three weeks, four weeks, but that's enough for making a, a difference. Mm. I used to take my plants out without any heating in the beginning of April back in Bedfordshire. Because yes. I, I know I know in a bedroom until then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I know there was a, a risk of frost at that point, but it was a very minimal risk. Here, you're very likely to have frost in the beginning of April. Mm. So I can't do that. I have to have some heating if I'm gonna do that. Um so yeah. You have to take that all into account. You have to know your local climate. So me giving you advice like when to start your seeds or uh, when to put them out in the greenhouse or outside, um, it's, it, it, there's a lot of factors that play into that. But yeah, 10 litre pots I think is a good one um, if you start your seeds. So for me, I start my seeds in January. Some of the quicker growing ones, so some need only you know, 45 days to get a harvest. Those ones I'll start a bit later, so mid-February, maybe even late February. And um, yeah, all the soup arts will be in January. And this year I'll be doing them probably a little bit sooner than I did last year. So it'll be first, second, third of January. And um, yeah, as long as you do it then, then you're going to expect a good harvest. And as long as you get into your 10 litre pot at the right time, that's how I'd go. Okay. You spoke a little bit about the frosts there. So Crispy G asked, do you get snow where you live? Just wondering how your greenhouses handle it as they were looking to buy one ah um yeah we 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 
we are a true test of the weathers, uh, the weather and the elements. Um, snow actually hasn't been too much of an issue. We have had snow. I've actually put up some pictures on Instagram where we've had cover coverage of snow. I get excited when we have a bit of snow, but we don't have nothing like what you'd get in Canada or you know some of the northern parts of uh, the UK. Um, touch wood. If we got snow that if it like settled on our greenhouses, like a foot deep, then I would be doing something to get rid of the snow. I would be pushing it off the roof because I don't want it to take up too much uh, pressure on the, on the greenhouse. I'm not worried about the smaller greenhouse and not because it's smaller, but because it's a rhino greenhouse, which that is super strong. I have a lot of confidence in that. I actually wouldn't bother too much if there was too much snow on there. I know it could handle it. Uh, the other greenhouse, don't have as much confidence in it. So I would be getting rid of the snow on that one. We're uh, quite lucky, I say lucky, where we are in Lincoln, the, the Lincolnshire winds that come the over. Winds the winds get rid of the snow. Yeah. <laughs> so the bigger, the bigger concern, the bigger concern for us is wind. Yeah. Uh, because we are highly exposed, we don't in Lincolnshire. It's flat, flat, flat. We don't have a lot of mountains around us or hills or anything, and it doesn't stop the wind. So when the wind comes in at certain angles, it can come in fast, and that's you know that's a, just an average wind. If we have uh, some storms, which we've had last year, I think we had some serious storms. I had to put all my uh, windows on storm catchers because mm -hmm. it felt like that like the the windows is going to blow out um that that's the bigger concern for us snow not so much of a concern really one of the topics that came up on sunday during the live stream was around mm. um pests and i know that you're a big fan of kind of um mm. planting complementary plants Companion plants. Companion yeah. plants, that's the word I was looking for. That's complimentary as well. <laughs> so Mad Craig asked, uh, I seem to remember you saying African marigold was best for pest fighting, but the last couple of times you've mentioned a different one, the French <laughs> marigold. Why the change or am I misunderstanding? So you are not misunderstanding. I might have spoken out of turn a couple of times. Um, so you get two different types of marigold, the African marigold and the French marigold. Um both are good from the perspective of uh, getting rid of aphids and things like that. However, the French marigold is the one you really want. So the African marigold is good. It it actually deters the, uh, the aphids and whitefly and that. They don't really like the smell of it. But that's just a minor deterrent. Some of them aren't going to be too fussed about it. So it's not really – it's not really – going to change your life but french marigolds on the other hand they actually attract hoverflies and uh there was well m all flowers really attract um ladybugs but it attracts hoverflies like crazy and hoverflies are they're incredible at getting rid of aphids and whitefly and we have loads of them you've, you've mm. seen hoverflies we we have them very early on in the year, even um, all over the greenhouse and ladybugs. We're so fortunate with that. I think a big part of that as well is because we have uh, our wilding area mm. where we've set up. And that brings us a lot of insects very early on. I haven't had any problems with aphids. There's a, there's a couple aphid issues that I'm having right now. There's a couple of plants with some aphids. But this year has been the best for no aphids. It's been awesome. So, yeah, it's... It's not your fault, Mad Craig. <laughs> French marigolds, that's the one you want to go for that attracts hoverflies. They surround it. Um, African marigolds, not a problem growing them, but I just grow the French marigold because uh, I don't want them cross-pollinating with things. So I don't know whether they can really, but French marigold, they bring in the hoverflies and I'm happy with that. So you'll see you'll see a couple of them in each of my greenhouses every year and out in the garden. It's They're growing wild now. In your polytunnel. Yes, yeah. yeah, we've got them popping up in the garden in yeah. random places too. And Daniel Katzman says, will you be selling the marigold seeds? I wish I could. I think I could do it. I just, you know, I'm, my business is a legitimate business and I've got to keep things on the up and up. Um, I could very easily get away with selling my marigold or including them. And I'd love to, I wish I could just include them with all my seed orders because mm. you know, I wouldn't want to sell them. I just want to include them in there. If, uh, you know, I'll see what I can do in the future. I'll look into it a bit more. The problem is uh, the legalities around selling them is a bit of an issue. Um, you yeah, know, I've managed to sort out what I'm doing with my chili seeds. But when it comes to things like marigolds, that might be a bit of a, a bit outside of my remit. So I'll look into it. I'll see what I can do. 
because if, if it turns out that I can somehow do it, uh, maybe because I would give them away, maybe that would be okay. But I got tons and tons of the seeds, mm. and I'd be more than happy to include some in the packages for, for free. I wouldn't want to sell them. Uh, so I'll look into that. We'll see what it can do. Okay. Cool. Well, those are all the questions. No, no. We've got one more from mm -hmm. uh, the live stream on Sunday, and then I've got a couple for you. Okay. Um, and this one kind of speaks to your experimentation, I guess. So Doug Jones asks, I'm starting. Doug Jones. Doug See, you're talking as quickly as me. Doug, Doug Jones. Jones says, I'm starting freeze drying chilies this year. Mm. It works well. Have you thought about trying this? And if not, why not? See, Mrs. Chili Champ doesn't realize that that requires me to have another tool. And uh, <laughs> I don't think she wants me buying any more tools. Um, I haven't tried freeze drying before. I'd love to. I'd love to give it a go at some point and maybe with some of the work that we're trying to do planning. at the moment mm -hmm. with the planning. Um, that's something we could maybe include there. I would like to do that. Um, it's, it's It wouldn't be great just for the chilies, but also for, for a bunch of other things we do here. Freeze drying is a pretty cool process. So I will look into it. I haven't done it before. I don't have a lot of experience with it. So I might hit you up, Doug, <laughs> for, uh, some advice there. See what you've done with yours. Awesome. So obviously coming into this, I thought, okay, some questions from me. And I think going through the evolution of your kind of YouTube channel in preparation for the report to come round, I just thought that your listeners might want to know, you know, what has been the most exciting experience that you've had or, you know, most surprising experience you've had throughout your time doing all of this <sighs> doing the youtube stuff so i forget about the business side of things um that's kind of an evolution of what i'm doing on youtube uh for the youtube thing <clears throat> i think the most exciting thing for me was i, I would get some messages and it was, it was before i mean i'm now at 190,000 subscribers it's mind-blowing um but I think it was like 10,000 subscribers or maybe around about there, or maybe 40,000, I can't remember, but it was a lot less than I'm on now. And I would get messages on Instagram from, I had a message from one guy, I wish I could find the photo, uh, but he sent a photo, he was watching my video that I just put out. It was him, his wife, and his two kids, and they're sitting on the couch watching it on the big big screen in their lounge. And they said, oh, it's uh, Chili Chump, Chili Chump time uh, in, <laughs> in our household. And I, I mean, it, listen, I'm, I don't do this because I want to be famous. I don't do this because I want to be recognized or, you know, that's sort the of thing. It's not, I don't want to be a celebrity. Um, I do this because just I enjoy sharing. So at first I was pretty uncomfortable with it. <laughs> yeah, it's, when, it's like, oh man, you guys, that's that's way too big on the screen. <laughs> you want to <laughs> see me in 4K. Uh, but at the same time, it was like, that's awesome, right? It's the fact mm. that he's, you know, it's a family that's sitting there enjoying one of my videos and that's just awesome. And I think on that same note, it was another message I got, and uh, it might've been on one of the live streams where uh, I think it was, I think he must be like 13 or 14. Um, and, and he's still, I think he's still a supporter. He's on my Chicken Chum Facebook group on on Facebook. And yeah, he was he was showing off his plants and, you know, he was excited about his season. And this is like 13, 14 year old kid that's, that's awesome. that that's getting excitement out of this. Like, like I said earlier on during this podcast is, you know, if I can just inspire some more people to grow plants and, and it's not because, hey, you want you to be green, but, you know, to, to just learn that, not everything comes with instant gratification and things that take time are the things that are most worth it in life. And growing is one of those things, right? You spend an entire year nurturing this plant and at the end of it, you're getting a beautiful harvest. That's nothing better than that. It's awesome. So seeing this 13 year old yeah, doing that and getting excited about it and getting excited about its next season is just it's awesome to hear and see. So yeah, those are the, those are the sort of things that get me excited about what I'm doing. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm sure we can have more questions later because I'm looking at the time. We're going over <laughs> that hour very quickly, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm sure you'll have more questions for me in the future. And hopefully, you guys are going to be asking us some questions as well. And it can be for Mrs. Chili Jump too. I'm sure she would uh, 
be happy to answer some questions about how annoying I am <laughs> uh, and the messes that I leave. Accent and... prone, untidy. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chilichum, for uh, indulging me with this. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. And the next one, I'm pretty sure Steve will be back. And, uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be mixing it up. Nice to have a little bit of a change yeah. here and there. And uh, I'll definitely be getting Caroline to help us out again next time. It wasn't that bad, was it? No, it wasn't as bad as I expected. <laughs> um, getting used to the sound of my own voice. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. And until the next one, stay spicy. <laughs>